The Naked Truth Report is sponsored by Kathleen Wells on AM870, The Answer. Warning, the following program has been rated T for truth. You can't handle the truth. Oh, we think you can. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report with your host, truth warrior and myth buster, Kathleen Wells. The place where we distinguish fact from fiction, where data is used to drive points home, and where Kathleen takes the position that Democrats and black politicians have destroyed black America. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report. Now, your host, Kathleen Wells. Ah, welcome, 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 my truth warriors and myth busters to the Naked Truth Report. I'm your host, Kathleen Wells, and let's see, what are we going to do? We're going to talk about what? Immigration. You know I love talking about that, right? I mean, that's like the main focus of the show. That's the main focus of the show. So, you know, three of the things I want to touch on, and in fact, I don't have a guest today, and I think I'm going to go to open phone soon. So those who want to call in, you can start getting yourself ready to, like, dial in or punch in or, how. you know, I'm like old school. We used to, like, d literally dial. You know, remember we had the rotary phones? People would stick their finger in the circle and, and um, bring it around in a circular motion to d literally dial. But, I mean, you don't do that anymore. It's like today, you know, everyone has a smartphone, and they what do they do? They press the number, I guess. I don't know. Uh, and, in fact, I saw on Facebook where uh, a grandmother was sort of like scolding a young, her granddaughter, who was probably a teenager, because she didn't know how to use a rotary phone. Oh, God, it makes me feel old. Anyway, the thing that I want to talk about today is uh, the fact that, let's see, that caravan was coming from Central America. It was all in the news. And it prompted Trump to tweet about it and also to do what? To send the National Guard to uh, the U.S. border. And so that's something that we want to touch on when you, when you call in. I have a few audios I'm going to play, but when you call in, you can touch on that. Should the National Guard, should the U.S. National Guard be at the U.S. border? What I found out se subsequent to uh, realizing that this caravan of folks from Central America were traversing closer and closer to the U.S. border, what I found out was, and in fact, someone said this morning on Face the Nation that, well, you know, it was sort of an urban legend because this activist group, I think it's called Borders, oh, what is it called? Let's see, I, Front, Fronteras, I don't know, I can't remember. But anyway, I have it written down somewhere. But this activist group uh, annually does this, uh, this trek towards the U.S. border, marching, marching. But this year, and they've been doing it for five to six years. But this year was like the largest. There, was, there were more than like a thousand folks, right? I think it was something like 1,200 folks. And they said, you know, and what I read is that uh, they've been doing it for five or six years. They make this trek for, as a symbolic gesture, as a symbolic gesture to, to sort of symbolize or reflect the fact that life in Central America, which is what, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, those life is just unbearable. I, you know, and, and, and also to sort of symbolically say that, uh, you know, I think they said there are citizens of the world. They believe in open borders. That, you know, that was something that uh, Hillary Clinton talked about, right? During the campaign trial uh, in 2016, she talked about the fact that she was for open borders. She was for open borders. Uh, let's see. So that prompted... Trump to tweet about it and also also to send in the National Guard. But, you know, liberals get up in arms about that. But, you know, Obama and Bush also sent the National Guard to the border, correct? Exactly. So uh, that's one thing that we're going to talk about. I, when you call in at the half hour, I want you to talk about the fact that this group from Central America. Oh, the other thing about that is that they disperse. This was the largest group, approximately 1,200, but they disperse the closer. They come in from Central America, and they disperse the closer they get to Mexico City into smaller groups. However, some will get, they said something like 100 to 200 will actually try to make an effort into the uh, 
into the U.S. border. In fact, I have an article where a woman, she's from El Salvador, and she says, let me read this for a second. Her name is Lilia, Lilianne Mejia. She says she's determined to get to Texas. She left El Salvador to jo join the caravan, and she said she heard on the news that Trump is mad because of them. He's, this is her quote, quote, he's not poor fighting for his family, Mejia, 25, said. This is what he just doesn't understand. She went on to say that uh, she made a... 2,400-mile journey from Chihapas, am I pronouncing Chihapas, Chihapas, to the U.S. border. And uh, she left her two sons, a three-year-old and a nine-year-old, behind. Uh, she joined the caravan because it makes things easier to make it through immigration if you're with a caravan. It seems the right way to do it, less dangerous, unquote. Uh, let's see, many are from the Honduras, let's see, poverty, violence, this I'm reading here, poverty, violence, and political unrest in their home countries forced them to make the journey, migrants say. Many are from Honduras where organized crime fuels widespread violence and protesters recently took to the streets after a contested election. Here's another man, there's an article, another man, Eric Sagostima from Guatemala. He was deported 13 years ago. He made it to the U.S. once, but he's not going to try it again. He's 61 years old because he thinks it's too difficult to get in now. And he says, United States is his quote, 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 quote. United States is very bad now because uh, we have a bad president. So that's one of the things that I want you to call in and talk about is uh, Trump dispersing the National Guard to the U.S. border. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, the fact that he is getting rid of catch and release, right? He's ending catch and release, and he has um, given immigration judges, he has appointed more immigration judges, and he's going to establish a quota. But before I go into catch and release, and before I go into having more immigration judges that will have a quota, that means they need to get through like 700 cases within a year. Uh, before I get to that, you know what, I want to play this audio. This is an interesting audio. I heard it for the first time today, and I want to play it for you to hear because it's, it's um, let's see, it was in front of the House Judiciary Committee in 1999. Terry Anderson was on that panel. I'm gonna play his audio second. But the first audio I'd like to play is from Izola. Her name is Izola, E-Z-O-L-A, Foster, who is a retired Los Angeles Unified School District teacher. Uh, Sullivan, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on the issue of illegal immigration. My name is Isola Foster and I'm president of Americans for Family Values. My president has brought me in contact with various neighbors, neighborhoods across America. I have lived all my life in the Negro community, the last half being in South Central Los Angeles. Today, I reside in an area labeled the Barrio, so actually, I could easily attest to the impact of illegal immigration on the so-called minority communities. Today, however, I will testify as a teacher who witnessed firsthand the harmful effects of illegal immigration on America's children. And I was forced from the teaching profession for talking publicly about it. My testimony is based on 33 years with the Los Angeles Unified School District serving as both classroom teacher and in administrative capacity. In 1960, I received a Bachelor of Science degree in business education from Texas Southern University in 19, Houston, Texas. In 1973, I received a Master of Science in School Management and Administration from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. My credentials include a life teaching credential for the state of Texas, life teaching credential for the state of California, pupil guidance, personnel, counselor, 
state of California. My teaching experience began in 1963 at David Starr Jordan High School in the Watts area of South Central Los Angeles. Enrollment was made up primarily of children from the four government housing projects surrounding the school. At that time, enrollment was predominantly America's Negro children. Today, enrollment is still primarily children living in the four government housing projects surrounding the school. Today, however, the enrollment is predominantly Mexico's children. Children from El Salvador, Guatemala, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Mexico are classified by House Management and Budget Office as Hispanic. From July 1985 to July 1996, I was a teacher at Bell High School in the city of Bell. Enrollment was 89.8% Hispanic. For the school year 1992-93, it was 96.8% Hispanic. 94-95, the last year I received the school's accountability report, it was 98% Hispanic. Now, the proximity of Mexico to California and the corrupt governments cooperating on illegal immigration make children from Mexico the largest number of both Hispanic students and illegal alien students in the Los Angeles Unified School District. As an example, either no music or only sounds of Mexico's music blared from Bales High School's public address system during recess and lunch. This resulted in clashes between Mexico students and students of other Hispanic cultures. Multicultural teachings ushered in with illegal immigration have increased tensions between Negro and African American children, between Hispanic and non-Hispanic children, between minority and majority, uh, majority children on school campuses nationwide. Illegal immigration has caused America's parents and children to be treated as second-class citizens in their own country. I have witnessed American citizens' parents and being told, your child may not be enrolled until you produce the birth certificate. That child is not enrolled and must sit out of school for however long it takes for the parents to produce that birth certificate. However, at the same time, Spanish-speaking parents bring their children in to tell school authorities when and where their children were born, and they are immediately enrolled. This is clearly a double standard where citizens are required to follow the law, but illegal immigrants are not. That is unfair. On the university level as well, illegal alien students are given more consideration and respect than is America's youth. David G. Savage, Times education writer, proved this point in his Los Angeles Times July 24, 1985 report on states' campuses will admit illegal aliens as residents. The article reads, California's public universities have decided to admit illegal aliens as state residents. At the University of California, Los Angeles, residents pay $1,296 for a regular school year. Under the previous policy, a student who was an illegal alien was charged the non-resident tuition of $5,112 a year. Now, illegal aliens will pay less in tuition than United States citizens from out of state? That is unfair. A copy of this news article was given to teachers by school administrators with a note. Please share the attached information with students. Now, our many illegal aliens can attend UC and California, California State Universities as residents and are not required to pay extra fees. How can anyone justify such treatment of American citizens as beyond me, and I dare say most other Americans? Illegal immigration has created tensions between citizens and non-citizens in what is known to some as the culture war and to others as the new race war in America.
Many new policies in various school districts have basically been to accommodate the massive invasion that is taking place in our country. And as schools accommodate new people who do not speak English, our own students suffer. In South Central Los Angeles, those who are being hurt the most are the Negro children and their fellow American students of Mexican heritage. Now, many public school teachers dare not publicly speak their support, even though they know that these children are being hurt in our schools. Why do they not speak out? Because of the support for illegal activities by government-funded, politically powerful, and corporate-financed groups and their allies. Oh, that was Isola Foster in 1999 in front of the House Judiciary Committee. She discussed an article written in the Los Angeles Times that discussed this Conf this issue, this problem, this conundrum back in 1985. We are now in 2017, and it is just, it has only exacerbated. It has only gotten worse. I mean, this is, you know, I'm surprised the American people haven't taken measures into their own, how do I say, taken it, taken it upon themselves to be more active to get things done. I mean, you know, this has been going on for 30 years at least, three decades at least. This is why Trump won. He knew it. And so I think most people, most truth warriors and myth busters that listen to this show, I think most of you agree with Trump's decision, you know, to send the National Guard to the border. It's nothing different from what Obama has done. But we have been, our Bush, we have been here for three decades at least. And it's only getting worse and worse and worse. It's very disappointing. Uh, you know, Sullivan, you know, I wanted you to play the part where she talks about uh, maybe, remember, I, you know, I said take took out like 170. I think it starts at 120. Can you play that part, please? <clears throat> okay, so I'll talk. I'll keep talking. All right. Act I can play Terry Anderson. Uh, I think I'm going to, let's see. Why don't we play Terry Anderson, and then we'll come back to Azola. So we're going to now listen to uh, Terry Anderson, who was also at this same Jud House Judiciary Committee hearing. Uh, Sheila Jackson Lee was one of the Congresswomen. She's from Texas. Uh, she was there present asking questions. And you guys, if you go into my archive shows on the Naked Truth Report YouTube channel, you will see that I confronted Sheila Jackson Lee, who has taken Barbara Jordan's place in, uh, place in the uh, district in Texas. Uh, I asked, so in other words, Sheila Jackson Lee has been aware of this problem with immigration no, I don't want to call it immigration. That's my faux pas. I made the same mistake last time. It is illegal aliens and invasion. It's not immigration because immigration is what? Legal, right? Okay, so uh, let's... Uh, oh, and who was heading this um, hearing, this House Judiciary Committee hearing, was Lamar Smith from Texas. Yeah, the Republican. Okay, uh, this was in 1999. So, Sullivan, could you play Terry Anderson? And after Terry Anderson, I will go back to the point, the audio that I want you to really hear from Isola, because it hadn't finished. Okay, go on, Sullivan. Thank you. I feel very privileged to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. I want to tell you of my reality. I live in South Central Los Angeles. I've lived there all my life. And I speak from the black perspective because I am black and I live in a predominantly black community. The problem with illegal immigration, whenever it comes up, is that people always give one side and never give the other side. They talk about the poor, poor immigrant who comes here for a better life. They talk about the poor immigrant child who must be educated in our schools. They talk about the immigrant worker who works harder than the black person works and he will take the job that nobody else takes. What you never hear is the other side of the story. You never hear that every time that illegal alien comes here, he displaces somebody else. That side is never mentioned. Whenever this, this subject comes up, you have organizations step forth and advocate for the illegal alien. You have Maldef, Mecha, LULAC, 
La Raza, and other race-based organizations who are exclusive only to one race of people and advocate for those people only. You never hear the other side of the story. The other side of that story is that somebody is harmed by them being here. I speak of my community because it's where I live. You will never hear from these people about the 17-year-old black kid in my neighborhood who went to McDonald's and was told, you can't work here because you don't speak Spanish. I don't say that happens all the time. I'm telling you of one instance of many that does happen. He was told that he couldn't work there because in the kitchen there would be confusion because most of the work workers there were Hispanic and only spoke Spanish in the kitchen and his English, his native language would confuse issues so he couldn't have a job at McDonald's. They don't tell you about the eight-year-old little girl, little black girl in my community. His native language would confuse issues so he couldn't have a job at McDonald's. They don't tell you about the eight-year-old little girl, little black girl in my community who sits in a classroom all day long and goes home and tells her father, Daddy, I'm not learning anything in school. So being a good father, he goes down to the school and asks the teacher why. And the little girl looks at him and looks at the teacher at the same time and says, because all they do is speak Spanish in my classroom all day. Now, there are advocates who will tell you, well, that's good. She's learning Spanish. She is not learning Spanish. She is listening to Spanish. There are translations all day long in that classroom for the immigrant child, for the illegal alien child, so that he can learn in his native language, and they don't care what happens to the little black girl. So he asked the teacher, can we get my, my child an all-English classroom? She says, let's ask the principal. The principal says, sure, and hands them a paper. He fills out the paper. The paper's for busing. He says, wait a minute, this is my neighborhood school. Why can't my daughter go to the same school that I went to in this neighborhood? He says, we have no English-only classrooms in this school. Now his child has to be bused 20 miles in order to learn in English and get a six-hour education instead of a three-hour education. They will never tell you that. I'm sure that has never been mentioned in this room. What else has not been mentioned in this room is the $100,000 house on my street that sold for $137,000. Many, many black people came and looked at that house, but they were not allowed to buy it. And I'm going to tell you why. It was a $100,000 house that was sold for $37,000 more than it was worth because five families went on that deed to qualify it financially. Now, you're telling me now that if my son wants to buy a house, he has to go and find four additional families to live there so that he can pay this inflated cost. You always hear about the real estate market in California, how it's booming, how it's great. The reason it's great is because illegal aliens are buying every single house in that city. I have had nine houses in the last five years on my street, and not one of those houses has gone to black people. Nine of them for sale. And there have been many, many blacks who have came and looked at these houses, but they can't buy them. Somehow, they don't qualify. I sense racism here. See, racism isn't just from black, from white folks to black folks. It's from anybody to anybody. And that's what I see happening here. This is out and out racism. It is a definite problem. Not just, and it's not just the entry level jobs, it's not just the housing, not just the schooling. Our skilled black workers in Los Angeles cannot find jobs. I'm talking bricklayers. I'm talking concrete. I'm talking roofers. I'm talking framers. I'm talking body and fender men who were making $20 an hour in the 70s and now they can't get a job in South Central unless they're willing to make seven or eight dollars an hour. This is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And the problem is not being addressed by our elected officials. We have gone to them, we have begged them, please help us in a deaf ears turn. It has been my experience, my personal experience, that when black elected officials talk, they speak in terms of minorities and people of color. When the advocates of the illegal alien speaks, he speaks about Latinos. We are always left out of the equation. We are never included in the equation. We have laws on the books to address these problems, but we're not Nobody has the resolve to step forward and use these laws. We could get these people out of our community. I have no ax to grind with anybody. I don't dislike anybody. But these people have completely ruined my community. We have things there now that we never had before. We have chickens. We have goats. We have people with laundry hung on the front fences of their houses. This is not a stereotype. This is my reality of where I live. We never had that before. We've got corn growing in the front yards eight feet high. That's my reality where I live. 
And I don't hate anybody. I'm just saying that my culture, my American culture, is being phased out, and I wouldn't care where these people came from in the world, be it the Balkans, Africa, Iceland, I wouldn't care. If my American culture is being phased out, I am upset. We are Americans, American first. That was the late, great Terry Anderson in 1999 uh, and at a hearing in front of the House Judiciary Committee on illegal immigration. But we don't call it immigration. We call it illegal aliens slash invasion and claims. That was in 1999. The late, great Terry Anderson. I mean, he tells a story passionately and vividly and we can we ima we really feel what he's saying right we feel what he's saying anyway we're, i'm gonna we're, we're gonna take a break in about two minutes when we come back from the break we're gonna play the latter part of isola foster who is a retired school teacher los angeles unified school district teacher she was at the same hearing as terry anderson it was in 1999 in her speech she talked about an article written in Los Angeles Times in 1985. So the issue is, listen, these politicians have known about this stuff for 30 years at least. They're disingenuous, they're insincere because they know what's going on. And, 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 and their constituents aren't their interests. No, no, they're not. The American people aren't the interest of the politicians. No way, Jose. Anyway, we're going to take a break. And when we come back from the break, we'll hear the latter part of Isola Foster. I'd like you to hear it. And we'll open up the phone lines. We're going to talk about the board. I want you to touch on the fact that the uh, Trump sent the National Guard to the border. And the phone number is 866-870-5752. I'm Kathleen Wells, your host of the Neck of Truth Report. And thank you for listening, my truth warriors and myth busters. We'll be right back. I'll say a little prayer for you Forever and forever you stay in my heart are you a local business owner? Are you interested in increasing customer counts and store traffic or increasing traffic to your website? If you answered yes, then you need to advertise on the Naked Truth Report. For more information on how to become a sponsor, please reach out to RJ Beaton at 818-517-KRLA. That's 818-517-5752. Or email us at rj at krla870.com. That's rj at krla870.com. Kathleen Wells, the host of the Naked Truth Report, wants to hear from you. Just like our borders, the phone lines, well, they're wide open. Call in at 866-870-KRLA. That's 866-870-5752. 866-870-KRLA. I'm your host, Kathleen Wells, and we're talking about immigration, folks. That's right. We were just listening to Terry Anderson, and he was giving testimony before the House Judiciary Committee in 1999. And we also heard Isola Foster. Isola Foster was talking about an article written in the Los Angeles Times in 1985. And here we are in 2008, I almost said 17, 2018 still dealing with the same issue. In fact, it's, it's gotten even worse. I mean, these folks have now organized a caravan to actually inch towards the U.S. border, slither their way to the U.S. border. 
now for the last five or six, seven years. They weren't doing that in 1985. They weren't doing that in 1999. Now they've organized to the point where they're, you know, making their way to the U.S. border as a symbolic gesture and demanding things from President Trump. And because they are citizens of the world. Do you see how after three decades, how this thing has actually morphed into something absurd? It's like absurd. It has been, what is that? Reductio ad absurdum. It's been reduced to absurdity. Like we're, are, you know, because we didn't deal with it 30 years ago. We didn't deal with it 20 years ago. Terry Anderson, who speaks so eloquently and dramatically, and you really see the stories he's, he's telling. You can really feel it viscerally, what he's talking about, right? So anyway, let's now play um, the second part of, Isola Foster. Thanks, Sullivan. And um, Ms. Foster will resume with your testimony, which I suspect is getting towards the end. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. Um, we'll recognize you and you can proceed. I spoke of being on the PBS NewsHour, Jim Lear, on the Immigration Amendment Bill earlier. As a proponent of the bill, I appeared on the Jim Lair News Hour with Congressman Gallicling. The opponents appearing on the show were Congressman Javier Becerra and Los Angeles School Board member David Tokoski. Two days after the show aired, the Los Angeles Unified School District and the Teachers Union, United Teachers Los Angeles, circulated throughout the campus and the community hate mail referencing the program and calling me a liar and a Nazi. Despite requests from state and local officials, organizations, individuals, my district and my union took no steps whatsoever to either investigate or end the hate campaign against me during the five week period I was away from the school. That's because May and June are vacation months on the year-round schedule for my students and me. Our first day back, July 1st, my students were getting into verbal fights with teachers who were telling their classes, Mrs. Foster is a racist, and into physical fights with students who believed these teachers. Flyers were widely circulated on campus to students and teachers that read, Isola Foster is using her job to build racism with lies. Foster shouldn't teach at Bell or anywhere. I had to have a police escort from campus. I received a death threat from a notorious Mexican gangster student. July 2nd, 1996 was the last day of my teaching career. Even so, the August 96 issue of the school's newspaper carried a front page article presenting me as a racist. The editorial page contained an editorial referring to me as a racist and a Nazi, and it was written by one identifying herself as a member of the Communist Progressive Labor Party. Underneath this article, of this newspaper in an American public school was listed the Board of Advisors for this school's newspaper. And just to name you three of these advisors, California State Assembly Member Martha M. Escotia, Los Angeles School Board Member who's now the President, Victoria M. Castro, and Southern California Director of the ACLU, Ramona Ripston. All of this action against me because I simply said what I saw, that a double standard exists for American students and illegal immigrant students, that the emphasis on cultural holidays that the illegal immigrants celebrate has created resentment with American citizen students 
and that racial violence is many times the result. And this is well documented year after year after year. There are reports of racial violence during the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday against blacks and Mexicans and again for the Cinco de Mayo. It's well documented that the overwhelming numbers of illegal immigrant students that swell California schools threatens to collapse what was once the best public school system in the country. For speaking truths, I was attacked professionally, both at school and in the media. And ladies and gentlemen, all of this is the truth. I'm asking you, the Congress, do the business of the American people, and take the steps that's needed. We talk about reforming the INS. We talk about enforcing the law. If I may suggest to you, if we really want to do the business of the American people, we would take the INS and put them at entrance of our airports and our waterways, and we would take our military from Kosovo and put them on Mexico's border. That is what we need. Ah, did you hear that? That was fantastic. And that was in 1999. She said, take the military from Kosovo and put it on the U.S. border. This has been a problem for at least 20 years, 30 years, 35 years. And you see the strategy, oh, they call, she left her, she was fired from the school district. This woman had more than 30 years, Isola Foster. I, I hope she's still around because I'm going to try and locate her and have her on the Naked Truth Report. She, you know, they called her a Nazi and a racist. And this was, listen, and this is the thing. See, we're repeating history. We haven't learned anything, but I'm so glad Trump is president. You better believe it. Because we, you know, we're not lying. We're telling the truth. Isola Foster and uh, Terry Anderson were telling the truth 20 years ago. And it's just gotten worse. It's exacerbated. It's an invasion. It's not immigration. And now they have this caravan that symbolic, symbolically makes a jaunt to, to, you know, trying to pressure the United States. I mean, this is actually horrible. It is a horrible thing what has happened to California. And you heard Isola Foster say that the group was the part of the Communist Party. So basically, California has become communist slash socialist. That's who's running things under the guise of being democratic, right? That's the truth. So uh, call in. The call in number is 866-870-5752. I, I want you to touch on and talk about uh, Trump sending the National Guard to the U.S. border and also this caravan coming here. And also call in and talk about uh, your thoughts about catch and release being ended. Catch and release is ended. Trump just wrote a, a memorandum on that on Friday saying in catch, catch and release, right? And also, what is the other thing? He uh, imposes production quotas for immigration judges. Immigration judges must have a quota and complete 700 cases per year. Also, the other thing that I want to say is like, there are like 960,000, 960,000 uh, illegal aliens who have deportation orders, and they've just ignored them. It's an invasion. It's dramatic. It's horrific. It's a big problem. And thank goodness for Trump. Okay, I'm going to take a call from Ann in Studio City. Hi, Ann. Welcome to the Neck of Truth Report. Um, of course, I back the National Guard. Shame on Governor Brown and the governor of Oregon. But in addition, the president has the right to use the Army Corps of Engineers to build a border barrier to act like a corral uh, so that it funnels the illegals to where the National Guard can stop them. Ah, well, that sounds, I, so you agree with it, right? Oh, absolutely, but I did check on uh, online um, the function of the Army Corps of Engineers. Yes, that that is part of their duty. To stop what? Uh, to, they can, uh, for for um, national defense, they can, actually they have uh, built some of the barriers along the border. Not, not nearly as strong as needed, but with the National Guard there, 
it would be simply like a corral to keep the illegals out. And with the drones overhead, it's just like the National Guard can be where the opening is and, you know, stop them. Right. So, I mean, this has been going on for 30 years, folks, if not longer. The Los Angeles Times wrote an article about it in 1985. And here we are in 2017, and we're still talking about it. Talk about how impotent and ineffective our politicians are. They have an agenda. They're pushing that agenda. They're forcing it on American citizens and California residents. Would you agree, Ann? Uh, yes. Um, in addition to what Isola said about the uh, college students, the law only says um, requires a free education through high school, but not college. They, they should not have any privileges at, at the college level. And they are displacing uh, Americans from college. Right, right, right. I think uh, what, was, what she mentioned is that illegal immigrants have the same fees as residents of California for the oh. UC system. Okay. And, and, you know, is that fair or should they have a – they're not a resident. Well, no, I mean, technically a resident is someone residing. But right. there shouldn't be the same rate. They shouldn't have the same fees as citizens. Right, right. I, I mean, if, if they were non-residents from, oh, say, China or Switzerland, they would pay more. They're not even citizens. Yeah. But they're residents because mm -hmm. they are residing here. So oh, you know, instead of calling them illegal aliens, the PC is um, undocumented residents. Uh, undo undocumented residents and are undocumented persons. And they also say, listen, I, at this point, listen, this has been going on for 35 years at least. There is enough already. You know, I was a LAUSD teacher and I went, I applied to one of the um, uh, Mexican neighborhood schools and the principal just told me. I don't know whether he didn't want me to be there because I was not Hispanic, but he said that students don't come to learn. He said what? He said the students did not come to learn. They don't come to learn. What school was that? Oh, let's see. It was in the Valley, East Valley. That's been so long ago, the name escapes me at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, Anne, I appreciate you calling into the Naked Truth Report. Thank you very much for your input, okay? Okay, let's uh, listen to, I think I have another tape with, uh, can you play the next audio? I think his name is Dan Morris. He was also at the hearing, uh, Sullivan. Oh, you don't have that one yet? Okay, so anyway, um, I have another call coming in, but before I get into that other call, I just want to mention one thing. I want to just mention this catch and release thing. President Trump signed a memorandum on Friday ordering, ordering agencies to expeditiously end the practice known as catch and release that allows immigrants caught in the U.S. without proper documents to be released from detention while their cases play out in court. As part of the order, Trump is require, requesting a detailed list of all existing facilities, including military facilities that could be used, modified, or repurposed to detain aliens for violations of immigration laws at or near the borders of the United States. So in other words, if these folks that were coming in from um, Central America with this caravan, you know, they say that a few, they do this, they have been doing this annually for the last five or six, seven years. So in other words, if catch and release was not disbanded or wasn't um, uh, ended, they could come into the United States once they're on American soil, uh, they have to, they can detain them temporarily and then they have to release them into the interior part of the United States and then they have to come back to court to determine, to discern whether or not they're entitled to get asylum. And the issue is that they never show up. They never show up. And also the issue is that 40% of the people are who are in the country illegally now are here on expired visas. Oh, you got it ready? Okay, let's listen to Mo uh, Dan Morris. He was also having a hearing at the, he was also testifying before the Senate House Judiciary Committee in 1999. Let's take a listen. Thanks, Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dan Morris, and I live in Rogers, Arkansas, which is in Benton County in the extreme northwestern corner of the state. Uh, because of my experience with massive legal and Ill 
legal immigration. Uh, I helped found a grassroots citizens organization called Americans for an Immigration Moratorium. I have seen and experienced how mass immigration hurts American citizens by increasing crime, increasing taxes, seriously compromising the quality of our public education system. Uh, and in 1988, I moved my family, our three-year-old son and our infant daughter, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to the northwest corner of the Arkansas Ozarks. We left Albuquerque because of an increase in violent crime and home invasion robberies perpetrated frequently by illegal aliens. After much searching for a community that I could raise my children in, I discovered a region that was largely free of serious violent crime and drugs, and that was northwest Arkansas. We moved there and, re and remained relatively crime-free from 1988 until about 1984. 1994. Then in 94, a wave of immigrants, primarily from Mexico, many illegal, began to arrive in our region, most taking jobs in the poultry industry. The poultry barons, the Chamber of Commerce, and other employers of cheap immigrant labor tell us that the immigrants are good for us and good for the economy. They tell us that cheap immigrant labor provides us with much lower priced products, cheaper chicken, it seems that they are so addicted to the cheap foreign labor that they have even had to advertise for it in Mexico and along the border of the United States. One problem is that these ads frequently attract both legal and illegal immigrants to our region looking for jobs. It soon became apparent in 1994 that our community was being virtually overrun by waves of immigrant wor workers, the majority of whom seemed to be illegal. In fact, the chief of the Border Patrol agent, the chief Border Patrol agent in charge of Little Rock office has stated that based on an analysis that they did in the early 90s, as many as 80 percent of the workers in the poultry plants were illegal aliens. A good example of the sheer number of immigrants flooding into my community can be demonstrated by the English as a Second Language program in the Rogers Public School System which has between nine and 10,000 students. In the 1991-92 school year, there were 63 students who required English as a second language instruction. In 1996, the Rogers Public School System had an English as a second language load of approximately 1,600 students. From 63 to 1,600 English as a second language students in just a few years is a staggering rise. And it gives you an indication of how the demographics have changed in my community. What has been the impact of this mass immigration into my region? It can basically be broken down into three areas. One, increased violent crime, tremendous increase in illegal drugs, and a rapid recognizable deterioration in the public schools. We saw an area that was virtually devoid of violent crime that is now frequently subjected to immigrant gang shootouts on crowded public streets, and in crowded, densely populated apartment buildings. Two shootings in the past six months resulted in the deaths of Salvadoran and Mexican nationals. In both of these murders, the perpetrators were foreign nationals, and both were able to flee back to their safe haven in Mexico. Well, they will most likely remain unprosecuted for these murders. Between December 98 and March of this year, the Rogers SWAT team, now Rogers again is a town of 35,000 people, has been called out at least six times. I can't remember the SWAT team previously coming out more than once or twice. In one recent SWAT confrontation, an illegal alien who had a long criminal record as a sexual predator, primarily against children, held off police for over nine hours with a Chinese-made assault rifle in the middle of a very densely populated residential neighborhood. The police have frequently had to intervene between rival gangs of criminal Ill immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. In fact, our city had a, police had an operation called a Operation Gangbusters, and they managed to arrest a large number of illegal aliens. We have been targeted as a major new market for illegal drugs from Mexico. Methamphetamine, cocaine, marijuana are now being imported to my, my community in quantities never seen before. In January of this year, a local, state, and federal drug task force named Operation Daycare arrested 30 drug dealers. The majority were Mexican nationals. Many of those were illegal aliens. It was called Operation Daycare because of the drug dealers' practice of hiding their drugs on their in their children's clothing or bringing their children to the scene of drug sales. Our public system has been overwhelmed by teaching in two languages. 
According to an area school superintendent, most of the immigrant children are two to three grade levels behind for their age. This slows down the whole teaching process, and our citizen children are suffering because of it. As the father of two children in the public schools, I feel that American children are being denied the quality education they deserve and that we're paying for. A child has only one chance to get a good education. Mass immigration is denying them that chance because despite the best efforts of teachers and administrators, the school's resources are being exhausted. I believe that most citizens in Northwest Arkansas would gladly pay more for chicken and produce if we, we could return to a safer, less violent, more drug-free community. And I believe that most Americans would agree. Uh, beautiful. That was Dan Morris. Uh, we've got two minutes left. I see people are on the line uh, to speak in. We only have two minutes, so call next week call next week. We're still going to talk about immigration next week. We're going to talk about catch and release, and I'm sure there'll be some new news, right? Uh, please go to my YouTube channel. We only got two minutes left. Go to my YouTube channel and sign up because we're trying to get my numbers up. Naked, the Naked Truth Report YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the station. Uh, I want to thank my call screener, Brooke, and my engineer, uh, Sullivan, and I want to send my love song to... Uh, folks with deep roots in America, deep roots in California, and deep roots in Los Angeles. This is my love song to you. Thank you. See you next week.